Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 25th of March 2024. Let's go straight to the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. And we can see that the personnel figures are somewhat lower than we've seen recently. 640, which is the, it's not the lower end of the range, but uh, it is certainly lower than we've seen for, for some time now. And I don't know what that's reflective of. Is it the case that the Russians are stepping back a little from all of their attacks in many great number of places. Well, to be fair, it looks like it's still really active in the Bakhmut area, really active in the Avdivka area and going south to Novomokhalivka is still active there. So I'm not too sure, but it could have quietened down along the south, quietened down along the Dnipro River and in the northeastern axis from Kupiansk to Kremina. So they, they, all of that could mean that that the loss numbers are less, although it is a Monday and sometimes we see them drop on a Monday due to Sunday figures uh, and whatnot. Anyway, 11 tanks is uh, fairly average there or thereabouts, uh, given what we've seen recently. 25 armoured personnel vehicles is pretty high. 22 artillery systems is about just above average as well. So um, fairly significant for the Russians there. Three anti-aircraft warfare systems, depending what they are, could be significant. 47 vehicles and fuel tanks is fairly high in that category, as well as seven pieces of special equipment. So, fairly heavy day for the Russians, but not the worst that we have seen, um, particularly in the personnel category there. Andrew Perpetch has not released his daily stats, so I can't refer back to what has been visually lost over the last 24 hours. That will come out shortly, no doubt. But I am going to talk for the rest of this particular segment on the strikes on Crimea the other night that hit two ships initially, thought to have hit two ships. Now there are claims of three ships or possibly not one ship, but another ship. And, and the, as far as I'm concerned, I, I can't tell what the, the end result is confidently, but there are people now talking about not just the... Uh, landing ships, but, but the, or not just the, um, I forget the names of them now, what were they? Yeah, that's it, the Azov and Yamal, but the Ivan Kurz as well, which is a ship that's been in the news a number of times previously. Anyway, satellite images of all four Project uh, 775 Raputcha class landing ships in Sevastopol. Near one of the ships, a trace of an impact on the pier is visible. Another ship is being towed into the dry dock, but on the satellite images provided, no significant damages to the ships is visible. Uh, some people don't agree with this. Some people saying that that might have been there previously, um, or I don't know. There are different claims as to, to what these satellite images show. Uh, there is this one here showing some fairly significant damage. Uh, and there is another that some people show that the ship is, you know, broken in half type thing. Not really sure what's going on there. But anyway, now the claim is three have been turned into submarines. I don't think it's that that bad for the Russians, but three might well have been damaged. A uh, reliable telegram channel publishes before and after satellite photos showing damage to Ru Russia's two warships struck by Ukraine in the morning bombardment of occupied Crimea. The first pic is the Azov craft that burns on the side, while the, the second picture, Yamal, looks to be sawn in half, uh, which is what I was showing. Um, and the main directorate of intelligence of Ukraine says damage to the occupied's larger landing ship, Yamal, is critical. It has also become known that the Russian reconnaissance ship, uh, Ivan Kurz was also damaged as a result of yesterday's attack on Crimea, but there's no mention of Azov there. So that's why I'm saying, like, I'm not sure whether they've shifted the damage from one ship to another or whether all three are thought to have been uh, damaged. In Ukrainian GUR clarified the situation about the attack on one of the Raputia class landing ships. It claims that the ship repair plant in Sevastopol was attacked, where, among other things, the Project 725 Raputia class landing ship Yamal was moored. According to them, the ship rolled to starboard side due to a hole in the upper deck. They didn't release information about the Azov large landing ship, which was also claimed destroyed by the general staff, at least initially, right? Um, uh, Ukrainian military intelligence saying the landing ship Yamal remains in critical condition with a hole in its upper deck. Russia is pumping water out of the crippled uh, vessel. Yamal was involved in Crimean an annexation and recently underwent repairs from 2017 to 2023. So there could be three ships that are significantly damaged 
or one ship significantly damaged and two others lightly or one other or, or you know any combination thereof nonetheless what we do know is that ukraine successfully struck ships in the port of sevastopol and i guess we'll have to wait to see what the exact damage is going forward right we're going to move on to distant strikes and last night saw a limited number of drones being used in Ukraine, Russians firing nine drones, eight of which were shot down. Um, one hit in the one hit was in Odessa, while debris caused most damage in Mykolaiv, as already put, reported by Tim uh, yesterday. So, uh, well, before we come to what I was just showing you, let's just talk about Mykolaiv. So, as a result of a night attack of enemy drones on Mykolaiv, eleven people were injured. So that appears to be from the wreckage of downed drones. So these forces and means of air defence in the Mykolaiv region destroyed four Shahid drones, but due to the fall of wreckage of the downed drone on the territory of the private sector, people were injured. Two out of 11 were hospitalised. And more serious damage in terms of infrastructure was done to Odessa, which caused blackouts. So, and then it, so this is the one that did hit. And remember when we talk about nights when five aren't shot down, so maybe it's something like 25 out of 30 or 25 out of 34, you know, like five or nine, whatever it is, those drones that do hit are hitting their targets invariably and are causing damage. So here is just one drone that got through. Eight out of nine was shot down, and this drone hits an energy facility in Ukraine's port city of uh, Odessa, suffering, uh, causing damage, uh, and that then caused blackouts in certain areas of the city. Um, so, you know, the these do cause consistent problems. Uh, right, now... As we are speaking now, I mean, this has just happened. Kiev has been hit with ballistic missiles. Now, there were talks of three big explosions. And there is talk about two uh, missiles being confirmed to be hit. And I don't know whether the three explosions refer to separate explosions. Maybe you hear an explosion as a missile's hit. And then it falls down and causes problem. And that causes another explosion as it falls to the ground or whether one missile got through. I don't think a missile's got through. But anyway, uh, this is happening right now in Kiev. So uh, this would have caused explosion and bits fell. Other blasts were heard, which is what Tim White says. Uh, ballistic Onyx M missiles probably launched from submarines travel at 7,500 kilometers. So little warning can be given. If intercepted, it would be close to the target. So there are claims that these are either uh, Zircon or Onyx missiles, ballistic missiles shot into Kiev. Interesting that only a couple of them shot, you know, and you, it makes you wonder what the intentions are in doing this. Um, so how I just want to play you this video because this is like what it looks like in reality. This is the reality of missile striking. So this is Kiev and you've got a school just below here where children are screaming and running inside. You might not be able to hear this. You can hear that, hopefully. And these children, two big old explosions there. Air raids going off in the background, and children having to run inside to cower in safety. Uh, from potential missile hits, you know, children at school. It's a school day, Monday, and they're having to. Uh, are your children having to run inside due to uh, an invader, aggressive invading army, um, trying to blow up your city with missiles? I would think not. Um, a residential building has been hit in Kiev. Apparently, a missile was intercepted, but debris fell on the center. In the center according to authorities uh, there is some basically you're not allowed to phone uh, or use your phone or whatever recording to device to uh, video any strikes it's against the law so they get end up getting really heavily blurred or edited in in interesting ways this is one that just shows the smoke and everything else around it is blurred out just one heavily covered censored photo from Kiev so far but clear there is a very big damage to one building and others also hit this is the Solomyansky and Dnipro districts of the city being affected. And uh, I'll just show you this in a second. Um, but yeah, so Kiev is being uh, hit as we speak. Um, it looks like there's some serious damage to that building. 
done there. And uh, as, as Jay in Kiev says, with US government frozen by Russian controlled Congress, Putin ups the game by striking the center of Kiev with hypersonic missiles. Meanwhile, Western partners uh, won't give us the air defenses that could easily stop the carnage today. Um, he's obviously angry about that. And this is what it looks like to have your house hit by a piece of falling missile debris. Um, part of the missile hit a private house in Osakorki in Kiev, according to local media. So you can see that there. You know, I mean, that's it's not what you want to have popping through your wall when you're just having your morning coffee. But uh, that's the reality for people living in Kiev. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, that is happening as we speak. I don't know whether other missiles will follow suit or whether it's just two kind of almost random arbitrary missiles thrown into Kiev um, by the Russians there. Now, the Ukrainians hit a Russian, with, with their drones hit a Russian power plant, Last night at Novichokask, which is in the Rostov-on-Don region, just to the northeast of the Azov Sea, northeast of the Black Sea in general. A Ukrainian drones attacked the Novichokask power plant overnight, after which a fire broke out. 15 explosions were heard. Substation was hit and two power units have reportedly stopped working. So the Ukrainians continuing to hit the Russian um, uh, energy infrastructure there big explosion also occurred in Nizhny Novgorod in Russia it's unclear what's happened yet so don't know about that but flashes in the background there and then we go on to talk about what the Russians did a few nights ago in their large strike so they had two massive strikes on Kiev recently uh, Russia uh, on Ukraine recently Russian massive morning attacking Ukraine's west hit a gas storage facility according to NAFTA gas CEO so this is when Lviv was targeted two nights ago. And you had that missile that w went through Polish airspace of 39 seconds and the po Poles didn't do anything about it. We'll get to that in a little bit. Russia fired two waves of missiles, including Kinjals, directed at Lviv region on the 24th of March. It took firefighters almost a whole day to extinguish the fire. So we don't often hear as much about these places getting hit in Ukraine. Like they, they are sensor, they're, they're tight on OPSEC and whatnot, but there has been significant damage done, being done on the last couple of strikes into Ukraine. The, as a result of Russian shelling, all transformer substations in Kharkiv were destroyed, uh, said the mayor. Uh, the local thermal power plant was also damaged, and currently 40% of the city's residential buildings are powered. So remember, I was going to interview on Friday. Anastasia Paraskovova from Kharkiv, but she had no power. No one had power. In fact, uh, we I spoke to Greg Terry and Jenny when they were just in Kharkiv and having to leave there, and they had experienced that, those strikes on Kharkiv that night. Well, as a result, 40% of the city's residential building are powered, which means 60% are not. Uh, Vladimir Kudrysky, CEO of NPC Ukrainago, so that's the Ukrainian energy um, state energy company. Also commented on the latest Russian attacks on Ukraine's energy facilities. According to preliminary estimates, a damage check that will be presented to the enemy for the latest attacks reached at least 90 to 100 million euros. If we talk about own, uh, only about Ukrainago's high voltage equipment. So just that one company is left with a bill of 90 to 100 million euros. That's how much damage is being caused to Ukraine by the Russians. So when the West is having to uh, bail out Ukraine in terms of its ability to function as a state, so not only are we helping with, with weaponry, but we're helping to keep Ukraine afloat financially. If we don't help enough with weaponry, it costs more in, in funding and support of Ukraine in general. So you can talk about the cost of weapons but if you're doing both things, then you end up paying even more on the back end with the damage that these missiles do when they get through. So it's actually cheaper, in a sense, to provide Ukraine with the means to destroy these, these uh, missiles or better still, the means to destroy the, uh, the missiles before they get sent up into the air to destroy the airframes that release these missiles or the submarines that re release these missiles or whatever. You know, Ukraine need to be able to stop Russia firing these missiles and costing this 
much um, money in terms of damage and the loss of lives that go with that. Now, remaining in Kharkiv, all substations in Kharkiv, as well as a combined heat and power plant, were destroyed, according to the mayor. There is no answer to the question of how long the restoration work will take. Repair teams are working, but there is a very serious damage. All transformer substations are destroyed. The thermal power plant is destroyed. Um, so I don't know if that's a different um, energy, that's different energy infrastructure than Ukraine go going on there, but not looking good. In Kharkiv, the operation of the subway, however, was resumed on all lines. There is now a 20 minute um, gap between the metro trains there. So it's 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 not up to full working standards, but people are, are really lauding the work of those who have enabled the subway to resume during times of war. It's amazing what some of these electrical engineers and transport engineers do in order to keep things working time and time again after it's like the a sisyphean rolling of the of the rock up the hill so that you can watch it roll back down again and you get on and you roll it back up again and that's what these guys are doing just fixing things for, for russia to break it again to then fix it again for russia to break it again but it's better to keep fixing it rather than not fix it and then obviously you're you don't have the functionality of whatever it is that's broken, but then Russia move on to blow up other things. And actually, I've talked about this previously, where the, there is a value in just repeatedly fixing something so that Russia keeps uh, firing at it because you, you're almost like baiting them to hit the thing that you just fixed again because it's better to fix and uh, and get hit, fix and get hit, rather than hit multiple things going you know, around Ukrainian... You know, the country, the nation, civilian and, and commercial infrastructure and so on. Now, Ukraine's DTEK, so this is a private energy company, loses 50% of generating capacity and recovery will take months, apparently. The largest private energy company, DTEK, um, lost that due to Russia's March 22nd mass attack. So that was a one, um, yeah, that, that would be, is that Friday's one, on the country's energy system. The CEO of one of its subsidiaries said on March the 24th. So serious, serious damage was done to Ukraine. And yet, how much was that reported compared to, you know, the, yes, the, the terror attack on Moscow was hor horrific for sure. But these kind of barrages by Russia are just massively underreported at the moment. And here's the thing, actually, and I was thinking this the other day, we might slag off mainstream media for not reporting stuff enough but here's the thing unless it's a public broadcasting company like the bbc if the and they have a different agenda to a private um news entity like cnn like uh, fox news or whatever so we can differentiate them but certainly with the private news media entities they will produce news if it, there's a cycle of of what's interesting for people, okay, then they'll click on it and then we'll get an understanding of what's interesting to them. And so we'll produce news more in line with that. Or if we've got a choice of news items on on the agenda for a particular day, then we will we'll have an idea of what our audience finds interesting and important and we will we'll play that kind of stuff uh, and we'll downgrade the the importance of these other news items that we know the the audience isn't so interested in so when you see mainstream media report on ukraine here's here's what i'm trying to say it's worth clicking on that so when the bbc have it further down here click on it when fox news have it further down here when cnn have it further down here click on it when they have their live feeds of ukraine so i i look at the guardian quite a lot and they still have a live feed. And the Telegraph has a live feed of what's going on in Ukraine. So they keep you da updated daily. And I know you guys come to me a lot. But but even if you don't fully read it, just click on mainstream media, Ukraine news. Because it's telling them that you care. The, the, almost the problem is that, that YouTube um, channels like mine and, and the many Ukraine reporters that there are. Jake Bro, much bigger people than me. Much bigger channels than me and and uh, Georgie and, and whatnot, 
they we all suck away interest away it's a kind of zero sum game we suck that interest away from mainstream media so mainstream media then go well no one's really interested in the ukraine war anymore so they downgrade it and then we look at mainstream media and go look at mainstream media how crap they are they're not even reporting this but actually it's a sign of what they will know will be a waning interest uh, in the ukraine war and it's this idea of like do they drive news or do they reflect the desires of their audience in what news they present? So perhaps this is just an idea, but perhaps if you do see mainstream media, if you've got an app or, or of a particular media organization, just once a day, flick onto the Ukraine news. Look on your app if you so on the Guardian app I have. I um I have a little section of like the mine news where I can tailor it to the stuff I want to I want to know about and actually it's only got ukraine on there but i'm going to start making a habit of cl just clicking i don't have to read it and spend time doing it just every so often click on that to let the guardian know that i am interested and people are interested in the ukraine war so just a little sidebar there uh talking about what ukraine did to russia in terms of uh drone strikes uh, this was from the attack on crimea the other night where those those ships were taken out there's also uh it seems that I, I reported that there was an oil depot next to a railway that was uh taken out it seems that three of these oil um uh what are they called reservoirs or fuel tanks that's it were destroyed at fardiska in crimea uh of course that would still be functioning in some way so you could expect the ukrainians to strike at that again then there was another a bit of footage of one of these, is it the Lyoti drones with the twin um, uh, twin tails at the back there and the propeller at the back that, that is showing itself to be incredibly precise again. I'll probably have to stop this before it hits, but there's more footage. And this is really similar to the footage we saw about a week ago at another oil refinery where it did almost the exact same thing. It flies around, finds its um, target, and then drops. And my, it can drop quickly. And it dive bombs onto that, uh, whatever part of the refinery that is, Kraken Tower or something, I don't really know. And then blows up and does some serious damage. Anyway, that was footage that came out again of, of a previous strike. Um, uh, I think I don't know whether that's another Chukask one. No, I don't think it was. I think it was from the other night. Uh, but anyway, it, just interesting to watch that that uh, drone do its thing, and also, you know, to see that being a repeated, uh, m you know, manner of flying and whatnot. And uh, w the previous one, I think it did a circle first, and then and then dive bomb. But they are very precise. And remember, that's like seven hundred, sometimes seven hundred to nine hundred kilometers away from uh, from the front line. So in incredible range on some of these things. I don't know about that one. Um, anyway, uh, talking about drones, Ukrainian drones, what is reported to be a downed Ukrainian drone that the Russian source says is made from shit and sticks by leading Ukrainian engineers. So they're trying to slag off the Ukrainians for doing this. But this is a bit like when the Shahids were slagged off for being, you know, not not the highest tech drones or maybe the Orlan 10 and Orlan 30 is a better example really cheap and cheerful drones using um, water bottles to hold the fuel and whatnot, which is quite a common thing for remote control um, airplanes and whatnot. But you're thinking, like, is this military grade tech? But of course, you get that asymmetry of, well, if an Orlan 10 costs $10,000 and you've you shot it up in the air and it's caused through its reconnaissance the destruction of $5 million worth of kit, then that is an asymmetry that you're going to take every day of the week. So here, when the Russians are slagging this off for being shit and sticks by leading Ukrainian engineers, then, as someone rightfully says here, I wonder how much the SAMs, the surface-to-air missiles spent shooting at the shit and sticks, drones cost the MOD, not to mention the destru destruction of their oil refining capabilities. But I'm pretty sure it's a lot more than cheap drones. So you, th this is an interesting drone. I've seen an analysis of this drone, or like what each of the parts are. Uh, and it is a fairly large drone, to be honest. Um, but it is certainly 
uh, fairly cheap um, in comparison to other drones, no doubt. Uh, but it's obviously attracted, I say obviously, I, I assume it's attracted surf, um, some surface to a missile or, or maybe electronic warfare, but possibly some uh, air defense system to take it down. And you're thinking, well, yeah, it, it was still worth, worth firing that into, into Russia. Now, talking about the missile that went into Polish airspace for 39 seconds the other night, Poland has explained that it was too risky to shoot it down um, as it crossed the Polish airspace. They saw the object uh, and thought it would leave Polish airspace, which it did. Uh, it's there for 39 seconds. And if their defense missiles missed, then perhaps those defense missiles could have shot into uh, Ukraine and hit civilian infrastructure or whatever, or indeed landed in Poland. So the Polish Operational Command says shooting down a Russian missile over Poland posed risk to civilians. Uh, they did not shoot down a Russian missile um, for that reason. Quote, the decision resulted from information from our radar systems. The assessment of the missile's trajectory, speed and altitude indicated that it would leave our airspace. Operational Command Spokesperson Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jacek Gorysiewski said. Now, as I will repeat what I said yesterday, which is that if you had um, a, a convoy of 600 Russian troops that were driving through Polish lands to go and attack Ukraine, but they wanted to attack them from behind, so they came from the north and circled round, uh, so that 39 seconds of, of time spent in Polish airspace, let's imagine that distance covered was being, which is, you know, when it's going 800 kilometers an hour or whatever, that's quite a lot of distance that covers, right? So now imagine that instead of being a single missile that causes destruction to Ukrainian targets, you've got 600 Russian soldiers on infantry fighting vehicles traveling through Polish territory uh, for the equivalent of 39 seconds of 800 kilometers an hour, or whatever it is. And they're going through the Russian territory and the Russian, uh, sorry, the Polish territory. Would the Polish look at them and go, well, we're looking at their trajectory and we can see where they're going to go. Um, so if we attack them, then it could cause some, some problems. So we're just going to let them go. In other words, the Russians can use Poland or any other country to attack Ukraine. So they can, they can send missiles through there. What's the difference between sending a missile and sending troops through there? So I presume that gives carte blanche for the Russians to send troops into Poland to attack Ukraine. And for me, it's functionally identical. Right, there's no difference, but would they let the troops do that? No, they wouldn't. So why are they letting missiles do that? They, you should have a Polish air defence systems. They have decent Patriot air defence systems. Should be shooting that out of the sky. That's my opinion, and I'll stick with it. Right, moving on to other bits and pieces. So, speaking of which, the Russian ambassador... Uh, will be summoned to the Polish minister Radoslaw Sikorski to provide information and explanations about the airspace violations. So there is some political fallout going on here. Our next actions will depend on this, said the R Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, the operation to blame Ukraine has well and truly begun for the terrorist attack on uh, the Kroker City Hall music venue in on the outskirts of Moscow. It's a terrible, terrible uh, terrorist event. Horrific stuff happened. Uh, ISIS admitted to it and then has admitted to it again and then has presented um, footage that they would only be able to get hold of if they were responsible for it, it seems. And so it's, it appears to be very clear that Ukraine really didn't have anything to do with it. Um, and that it was ISIS. And yet Russia is trying to blame Ukraine and indeed the CIA. And I talked yesterday about how even American uh, shills for Russia, like Scott Ritter and Colonel... Um, no, you can't even... He's not allowed to call himself retired colonel anymore because he's been in violation. He's slagged off the US and the US Army so much that he's not allowed to use his former title. So it is just Douglas McGregor. Um, he so both of those have been shilling for Russia in blaming Ukraine and blaming the CIA, right? It's completely conspiratorial thinking. Well, it's just what the Rus what the Kremlin want them to say. The Russian bots have already gone into overdrive to promote narratives on Ukraine and the US and even British MI6 uh, roots of terror incident 
uh, the roots of the terror incident in Moscow. Uh, Oliver Carroll's written a piece in The Economist on this. Uh, and it is, yeah, how Ukraine became the unlikely home for ISIS leaders escaping the caliphate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously uh, tongue-in-cheek there. But this is what Putin is trying to communicate. And in, indeed, it is working domestically. And I'll get to that in a second. Then what we've had is in reaction to the horrors. And remember, this is a horrific terrorist event. And so the Russian people will want their revenge. Human nature is very much like that. We are vengeful people. And as a result, and in fact, some of these pictures are now being taken off uh, Twitter. But images have been released on Telegram showing Russian security officials using a torture method involving electrical device uh, being attached to the individual's testicles, causing them to be electrocuted during the interrogation uh, in this case of Faridun uh, Shamsuddin, one of the ISIS terrorists from Tajikistan that, that were captured yesterday in the Bryansk region of Western Russia. So there's that. Then there's also imagery that has been released of another one of these four that have been captured, having his ear cut off by the interrogators, the Russian interrogators, and being force-fed into his mouth, right? And I'm telling you this because this indicates a stark difference between Russia and, and, the, and the rules-based world, right? The Western world that, that we live in, and we see Russia as a threat to this. And this is one indicator of how they operate on a different level. Now, although for many in... in so if that happened in the UK or in the US or in France, right? There would be so many people calling for this kind of activity, that vengeful nature that we have deep inside us that we try and rationally overcome. That, that wants to get revenge for doing that, and you, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the lex talionis, as it's called um, in, in legal speak, talon law. So it's like, you did that to, to me, we're going to do that to you type thing. But in a liberal rules-based system, you know, we talk, talk so often about the, 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 the rules-based world that we are trying to advocate for, that, that, that is standing against the... Uh, the Russian imperialism and the war crimes taking place and so on and so forth, we, we we need to show ourselves to be better than that, right? So although deep down we might want that to happen, we need to let law take its course. And if we start going to lynch mob vigilanteism, then this is that is a slippery slope downwards. And 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 although you might think the law takes too long and doesn't give the enough punishment to these horrible people. We have to we have to have faith that the law will do the right thing because the alternative is this, which is anything goes dictatorial um, regimes that that allow their uh, their legal arms or their law enforcement arms to take the law into their own hands and effectively uh, sanction torture of people. So you know, here is the guy; he's lying there. Uh, and you have his his genitals there are attached to this um, machine, <clears throat> and they're recording that, and that's getting out. Imagine that in your country that that your law enforcement would release on Telegram, cutting off someone's ear and force feeding it into their mouth and and their face covered in blood. I mean, I've seen it; it's horrific. And here, someone's genitals being electrocuted. As Jane Kiev says, Putin's 20-year propaganda blitz pushing Russians to embrace prison culture, torture and war has done its work. Russian police casually posting photos of electrical cables attached to the genitals of one of the, un un the unlucky that the FSB chose to commit Putin's false flag operation. Now, I disagree with where Jane Kiev's going with that because I don't think it's a false flag operation. Um, I think it's a genuine terrorist attack and they've caught these guys and they're just massively torturing them in, in, in vengeance. But I just think that it shows a difference and I, hopefully the nations that we live in will never stoop to the level of doing this, however much you think these guys deserve it, right? And imagine if that's your child or your spouse that was killed in that terrorist attack, how you would be feeling. We have that very, very strong natural tendency towards vengeance. But, you know, if we had that all the time in our criminal system, we would just have a, a, a society of chaotic vigilanteism where we where we we don't allow the law to take its course and we take the law into our own hands. We either go all in on that 
or we don't do it at all. You can't cherry pick, oh, this particular crime is bad enough that we can just torture them. But generally, we shouldn't do that to people that have been caught shoplifting. Like, you can't cherry pick. It's like, we have this legal system, we either let it take its course, or we don't have that legal system at all. You've got to make your choice. And if we're living in a liberal democratic society, and I mean liberal in terms of freedom, not in terms of, like, social moral liberalism, if we have a liberal democratic system with, with a rules-based order, then we have to have faith in that. Because otherwise you get this. So this is a Russian court. So now they're going through the legal system after they've taken the law into their own hands. A Russian court has arrested the defendants of the terrorist attack on the Crocus City Hall. All of them uh, have been accused of committing a terrorist act and they face life imprisonment. But when you look at them, all of them have been beaten up. This guy here on the right, top right has lost his ear because he's a guy, he was a guy that had his own ear force fed to him. You have a guy that came into court that's so severely tortured that he's in a he's in a um, hospital robe with his bare ass on show. Like, well, actually, no, that was from injury. Sorry, I take that back. That was from injuries from the actual terrorist attack. That's why he he's injured. But you've got other people whose, whose faces, these guys have been so badly beaten that it's evident on them in, in court. They've had plastic bags put around their heads, you know, and, uh, and all sorts of terrible stuff happening to them. And, 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 and the Russians don't care. They've got to a, a point where they're like, yeah, we've done that. What are you going to do about it? And it's kind of a sign to their own own public as as well, saying, yeah, if any of you guys are thinking about doing protesting against the the Russian state, this is what happened to you. So don't do it. So there's a lesson to be learned uh, for for dissenters within Russia from from this kind of behaviour. Uh, and then Dmitry Peskov was was questioned on CNN about, I mean, I don't think directly, but about torture of suspects in the terrorist attack on Crocus. I leave this question unanswered, he said. I don't know if he was actually questioned by CNN directly or whether he's referring to questions from CNN, but I leave this question unanswered. In other words, meh, there you go. Now, alongside all of this, domestically, Russia is is a big melting pot at the moment. In the regions of Russia, new acts of discrimination against migrants are noted after the terrorist act in Moscow. Res residents of Kyrgyzstan who arrived in Moscow were not allowed out of the airport for a second day. According to one of the detainees, people from Tajikistan and Ukraine are being beaten. Enterprises are required to report on migrants among their staff. Taxi drivers receive messages from clients demanding to know their nationality and threats. I mean, this is a sort of, of situation that results from a big terrorist attack but then also a very heavy-handed way of dealing with it and meanwhile as i say the domestic audience has sucked up this idea that ukraine are somehow responsible and when you've got douglas mcgregor when you've got uh david Sachs, when you've got scott ritter perpetuating these myths then you get bombs being sent with for crocus city hall Glide bombs, Russian glide bombs having that written on them. So these soldiers are thinking Ukraine were responsible for the terrorist attacks in Moscow. It's just ridiculous, of course, to us, but for them, fair cop. And on the back of this, it's just really interesting to note that Putin's approval ratings rise during wars of aggression and after terrorist attacks, no matter the perpetrator. Therefore, the more people die in terrorist attacks, no matter who organised them, the FSB or ISIS, his support will grow. So I, I think that's well put there by Euromaidan Press because they're saying, well, look, if you believe this is a false flag attack and it was the FSB that did this, or if you believe it's ISIS that did this completely independently, the, same, the result is the same, is that, Putin and the Kremlin benefit and they benefit due to something called the rally round a flag effect and I've talked about this previously you look at 1980, uh, 1982 and the Falklands War with Margaret Thatcher Margaret Thatcher was tanking in the polls and the Falklands War came along and she went all in on the Falklands War everyone rallied around a flag and she got through that that next election easily right you look at 9-11 and Bush and Rudy Giuliani before he became a hair dye sweating mentalist was deeply popular for his response as mayor of New York to the 9 11 attacks, as was Bush. And they did very well out of that. 
the rally around the flag. And it happens because people thrill, feel threatened from the outside. And if you feel threatened from the outside, you unify together on the inside. This is why I wrote an article years back saying, do you know what the best way to unify this whole world? We're so divided in this world. We need to be attacked by aliens. And I wrote a whole article on the fact that we should be attacked by aliens and it's the only way to unify us because of the rally around a flag effect. Is that the only thing that will unify us is feeling threatened from the outside, uh, sadly. Um, and so this is this is true for for Putin. Putin will know this, and it's what happened in the, in the Beslan and in the apartment bombings that that the we now know that the FSB organised. So Putin has known this before and has used it before. I personally don't think he used this then purposefully. I think this was a genuine terrorist attack that happened. But he's going to capitalise on that. And then if you can start attaching blame to Ukraine and the CIA, you can capitalise on that growing fervour for, for Russian nationalism. This is us against them. And, and you then start saying, yeah, it was Ukraine what did it. And they go, oh, we all hate Ukraine. It's like, yep, yep. And so therefore we're going to go more to war. Yeah, go to more to war. Yep, yep, yep. And we're going to mobilise you to do it. Yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah, not so sure. Yeah, you were just screaming then about how much you hate Ukraine because of that terrorist attack. So we're going to mobilise you. Yeah, but I was... But how about him? It's like, no, you and him. And that's how it works. And so and so, this will be used sociologically. It's, um, yeah, his approval rating is doing very well. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Uh, so just to go on to something else here, this is what the boom looks like to the harbour of Norosisk, which is where much of the Black Sea fleet is now harbouring, rather than Sevastopol, and you've seen Sevastopol get hit by missiles. This is a port where it's not as protected as, um, uh, and not it's not as big and not as deep as Sevastopol, but it but they have protected it somewhat, so it's going to be very difficult for Ukrainian drones to get into Novorossiysk and strike uh, Russian naval vessels, which means you have to do it from uh, the sky using cruise missiles, but they probably don't have the range to reach there with just the Storm Shadow and Scout PGs. But um, yeah, anyway, that's Novorossiysk. Uh, right, Ukraine is building more and more fortifications also in the desert region. So these are being built behind the lines. I saw some of these being built in the Kherson region in places where I was like, well, I'm not expecting Russia to uh, to storm across the Dnipro River anytime soon. And yet Ukraine was building these uh, big time. And, you know, it's wise. It's a good insurance policy and, and be prepared in, in a way that people argue they weren't so much behind Avdivka. Um, so anyway, uh, going back to the idea of uh, Douglas McGregor here, but the idea of uh, disinformation, this is Ilya Ponomarenko re um, reigning against Douglas McGregor. OK, this is just pure ass clownery at this point. Just to let you know that that these people are still spouting the same nonsense. Zelensky is the architect of war, death and destruction in Ukraine. And as, I, as I've said before... He's not Ukrainian. Zelensky is from the Far East and grew up as a Russian speaker. He was picked up as a puppet by a wealth oligarch, Ihor Kolomoisky. Right. Well, the reason why I'm showing you this again from Douglas Gray, I don't want to give him the oxygen of, you know, of amplification here. But what I want to question, and I'd like to know what your ideas of this are, is I wonder, it's got to the point where I wonder whether someone like Douglas McGregor is controlling his Twitter. Is he so much of a puppet of, of Russia that actually they're, they're just writing Kremlin propaganda through his Twitter account? Like, does he genuinely, genuinely believe this? Because this is just pure Russian propaganda now. That is, that, there's, there's no decent rationality involved in this kind of approach. Like twisting ideas about who Zelensky is. Uh, and like Zelensky is the architect of war, death, and destruction in Ukraine. Like you can't genuinely believe this, and unless you're such a puppet of the of the Kremlin that you've lost all ability to critically think. So is that the case, or is this literally coming from the the Kremlin, either by having control over his uh, over his Twitter account, or by sending him what he needs to say, and then paying him handsomely for doing so in some way, and then he spouts that. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if in 10 years' time this guy's got an apartment in Moscow and is living there. Uh, 
just it just it's so overt. And then on the other hand, some decent humans still exist. So British actor Benedict Cumberbatch, you might know him from um, Sherlock and many films uh, and whatnot. He's uh, He's, he's a good old British actor, has repeatedly expressed his support and solidarity with the Ukrainians in 2022. During the Santa Barbara International Film Festival award ceremony, the actor took to the stage to accept uh, an award and unfurled a blue and yellow flag. That's absolutely fantastic. And actually, there's a long line of Hollywood and um, actor personalities who have supported Ukraine. Uh, we've seen Robert De Niro, Stephen Fry, Emma Thompson, Bono, Sean Penn, uh, Liv Schreiber, Jessica Chastain, Ben Stiller, Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie is a big uh, supporter by all accounts. Um, uh, I think Ryan Reynolds, Blake Lively, Ashton Kutcher, Mila Kunis, so on and so forth. So lots of people uh, have have shown their support, which is really good. And if they keep this in the public consciousness, then that is excellent too. Anyway, that's enough from me. Take care. Speak soon.